So last week, we talked about community. And I was kind because I didn't preach my whole message all at once. I have more. If you didn't get to hear last week, you might want to go catch last week, and then you can put it with this week when you're done hearing this week, and then you'll like, it'll all make a lot of sense, maybe. I didn't promise, <laughs> but it should. And uh, I wanted to go back to our original text from last week, so we're going back to John chapter 17, if you want to turn there. And, and I, I spoke last week about this being the Lord's Prayer. And now a lot of us, you know, we think of, of the, uh, my, our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, you know, that as the Lord's Prayer. That's the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. But I know some guys who like to think of this as the Lord's Prayer because this is actually Jesus praying. And, and it's, his, it's his most, I guess, I guess, important prayer. It's the prayer that he prays just before he's crucified. And so in verse 20, he says, just reminding you of some things to catch up to lay some foundation. Uh, Verse 20 of chapter 17, my prayer is not for them alone. First of all, maybe I should tell you who them alone is. Them alone would be his disciples who were with him. I don't know that we can say all of his disciples were with him. A lot of people think of the disciples and they think of only the 12, but the scripture actually says there were more than that. There were women who were disciples that weren't in the garden, but they were disciples. I even heard a guy that the other day mentioned, you know, he said, did you notice the first person Jesus speaks to after he raises from the dead is a woman? Because, you know, if you want to get things done, you, you find a woman and you talk to her and you tell her what she needs to tell the guys. That's what it was. So he, my prayer is not for them alone. That is just these disciples that were with him. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Hmm, who that? That would be us. So Jesus was praying for us in this prayer. This is a prayer for us. That all of them may be one. That would be us. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. And then I added the word why here this morning. Why? He's going to tell us why. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. He wanted wanted us to be one in him so that the world would believe. I'm going to read a little bit more here in a second, but this just comes to me too. I have seen people who were healed by the power of God who refused to believe. I had a good friend in high school. And people will make fun of this sometimes. You know, they'll say, do you lengthen legs at your church? Yeah, we do. My friend had one leg that much shorter than the other when he was a drummer in our marching band. But he wanted to be in the marching band in the worst way. But he had one leg that was way shorter than the other. And somebody prayed for him. And he bragged about it at band camp. Yeah, I got prayed for. I'm all good now. And he was. He used to always be out of step. Now he's good. You know, he, was, he was really touched. Did he want to become a Christian? No. Did he see a miracle? Yes. By the way, he's a Christian today. But that wasn't what made him a Christian. I just wanted to point that out because I have prayed for people who were complete heathens and seen them have crazy good miracles and then never see them again. They never started believing Miracle isn't what Jesus thought was the most important thing that the world might believe. Isn't that interesting? What did he think was the most important thing that the world might believe? Right here. That they would be one so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them, verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. This is what God's looking for. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. See, this community, or as I said last week, this common unity that we share in is what causes the world 
to see something that they won't see any other way. We have lots of ways that we want to accomplish stuff for God, but His way might not always be our way. So I talked about that unity that Jesus wanted us to have last week and that unity that I think we're feeling more and more of in this house. That unity that some of us feel, especially because we've been with each other and we've known each other for years and years and years. And I think there's something in that that God wants to do. We also looked at a verse in Acts, Acts chapter 2, Um, I'm just going to read verses 46 and 47. I think we actually looked at four, but 46 says, So continuing daily with one accord in in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I read the same verse, by the way, last week out of the Message Bible, though. Let me just read you verse 47 again. People in general, this is out of the Message, people in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added to those who were being saved. People liked what they saw. You know, last summer, we talked about this last week a little bit too. We had stuff that we went through and people who were distant from, or no, distant from our church, but you know, members of other church, but they came to visit our church because they had to be here for funerals. And guess what they saw? They saw something good. I had a lot of compliments and comments from people about this church and about what they saw among the people of this church. And it was, it was actually extremely good, especially in the midst of a time that was extremely hard. It meant a lot to me to hear people say, wow, you guys got something going here. Having favor... As it says in the one version, I don't think we think about that all the time the way we should. Having favor. Favor means they like what they see. That's what it means. So, I'm entitling today's message, Community Outreach. And when I say community outreach, I don't know about you, but maybe people listening you know, via Facebook or watching this later on YouTube, they'll hear the term community outreach. A lot of Christians hear the term community outreach and they automatically think that I'm talking about organizing to go reach out to our community. I'm not. I'm not against that. But that's not what I'm talking about today. When I say community outreach, I'm thinking of something that I think we need to kind of come to the revelation of and get more excited about. Like, what are you talking about? Well, the scripture here in Acts wasn't talking about community outreach, but it was talking about community. The way the church was growing, it never says that they were going out to get people, to bring them back. Isn't that interesting? Am I saying that's wrong? No, no, don't don't get me wrong. But I'm saying the church, the early church in the book of Acts right here in chapter 2 wasn't growing because every Saturday afternoon they all got together and had a group of people and they handed them tracts and they went out and they knocked on doors and talked to people. Or they went out in in roving bands to find people to drag to church. (laughs) It says that they were doing community together And as a result of doing community together well, the people around them liked what they saw. They reached out to the people around them by doing community well. Community outreach. Not by going into the community. Again, not that I'm against that. But by being a community that when people looked at the community, they were like, I want me some of that. That looks good right there. I think I'd like that. I should be. Can I be part of that? How many of you think it'd be easier if people came up to you and said, can I have what you've got? It would, wouldn't it? They liked what they saw. And then, as a result of what they saw, 
God was able to add to his church daily. We may not see God add to us daily, but what if we could get God to start adding to us? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be, how many of you think God would be better at it than we are? Yeah, he is. He's, he's really good at this. So what were they doing that God added to? It was this thing called common unity or community. A lot of churches, including us, do a lot of things and hold a lot of events so they can attract people to their services. And then you got to make sure the service has this just right and that just right and this thing and that thing and got to do this and got to do that. Got to have this, got to have that, got to have that. And we're all working our tails off to have all this stuff so we can impress the people who walk in the door. And sometimes that just gets you flat out tired. By the way, I've seen this over the years in church growth seminars and programs and one of the things they warn you against is now you got to get all these people doing this you got to have them and then be careful that you don't wear them out so people become part of a church and they're busting their tails to promote the church and then they get worn out promoting the church. Why? Because instead of having community where they were receiving, they are having this thing that they have to keep pumped up all the time. It's like a balloon with a hole in it. You're just, just trying to keep it. <laughs> Never quite works. But if church growth could come by us just really learning to love each other, wow. Like the deeper we love each other, the more church growth we would see, the more community we had, the more connection, the more common unity we had with each other, the more God would do stuff. That would be, because I like that part. How many of you like that part where you just get to hang out with people you love? And you get to worship with them and you get to have a good time with them and you get to know them and they get to know you. Wait a minute, I'm not sure about that get to know you thing. I don't know if I want them to know me or not. I want you to know me this much. We're going to get to that in a minute. Can we have that kind of community? I think we can. I think we do have it to a degree. I'd like to have more of it. More please. I think more would be good. And I believe that the greater the level of community we have, the greater growth that we will experience. And I don't mean growth that comes and goes, but I mean growth that lasts. It's long-term growth. It's the kind of growth that changes how we think and changes how we function and changes how we walk and talk and, and do everything. And I think that could be extremely powerful. Now, I want to look at a verse that might, at first, not even, like, if I read it straight through, you'll be like, and how does that tie in? But here's where we're going to go. James chapter 5, and verses 14 through 16. And, and you might not see community in this, like, right away, but you will when I get done. So James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16 says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and pray over them. And anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Just for the fun of it, let's do something we did a little bit last week. Could we really have community if we didn't have leaders in the community I don't think it would work very well you need people who have been part of the community to help people who are coming into the community feel part of the community does that make sense so we, for example we have elders in this church now that doesn't mean that you're not an elder just because you're not on the board of elders but if you're on the board of elders in this church would you please stand anybody on the board of elders here today <laughs> John's here Harold's here. Harold, stand up, Harold. 
Get Harold to stand up, somebody. Is there, uh, t- cord's missing today. He's suffering because he has three children. Oh, and Beth's not here today. She's sick. And what? And Mark and Melissa are gone. Yeah, okay. So we're low on elders today. And his wife's in the back. And Well, actually, Joan should be standing too. Stand up, Joan. Joan's one of our elders because we, we, we have elder couples when we can. We love to do that. Okay. So do you know these people? Yep, yep. Take them out to lunch sometime. As often as possible. There you go, see? <laughs> Words of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> or, or I'll tell you what, if you can talk them into taking you out to lunch, I'll reimburse them. John's thinking about steak. Steak. I appreciate these people. Do you realize that because they carry a responsibility in this house, God says he's going to bless you through them. If they pray for you, you'll be healed. I don't know if I believe that. Why not? It's what God's word says. They, they, by the way, there's oil right there. If you guys have anybody come up to you afterwards and want to be anointed with oil, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. That's what I just read. And then it says... It says something about a righteous person. I want you to understand, it's not their righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ they walk in. We just did a little bit ago, people sometimes stand up and clap when the pastor's introduced, or when we have somebody, you know, even do announcements, we try to clap and just, just rejoice, and we, we try to support them. We stand to honor a righteous man, a righteous man in, the, in the name of a righteous man, and we receive a righteous man's reward. The reward that they carry could be healing and a touch in your body and something that you need. So here's an idea. You should go for that. Let's give them a hand, by the way, as they sit down. Woo-hoo! Yay, elders. Even though they're all missing today. <laughs> Everybody's gone. Not the ones that count. Not the ones that count. That's right. John's here. The, the, the elders are divinely mandated by God to pray, and he promises that he'll heal. So we should try to take advantage of that, I think, as often as we can. Um, in verse 16, it says that we confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. You know, that's community. When you have people that you're connected to that you can just say, look, I'm, I'm not all that in a bag of chips in this area of my life. I'm struggling. I'm having a problem. That's community. I don't recommend you, by the way, just go around blabbing your shortcomings to everybody all the time. That's not, that's not what we're after. What we're after are people who will pray for you, um, who will uh, be with you. And I'm not just saying just the elders only. I, I, think, I think if you have people that you're connected to, you can say, hey, here's, here's, where, I, here's where I come up short. Here's where I have a problem. And if you have a real community, you can do that. And you, again, you can't just do that with anybody, but it takes a level of community that even a lot of churches never get to, right? Think about it with me. Think about it with me. A level of community where you feel safe to tell somebody that you recognize is in that community and been in that community for a while. You recognize and realize what they need and, and they recognize what you need and you guys are able to talk to each other wouldn't, wouldn't that be, like, amazing and helpful? When we isolate ourselves from community, and I know a lot of Christians who have isolated themselves from community, it can be a real dangerous thing. It can be a real dangerous thing when we isolate ourselves from community. I know people who, I, I talk about this sometimes, Facebook believers. It's a little scary to me that some people will isolate themselves from community, but they'll talk about Jesus on Facebook. Because when you have a blind spot and you don't have community, guess what you still have after you're done with Facebook? A blind spot. That's why we need community. 
when, when we disconnect from community, we disconnect from the body from which we get what we need to live a real Christian life. In fact, we just basically disconnect from Christ himself. We disconnect from Christ himself. I, I, I wonder sometimes, do we really realize that? That without community, without people that we're really connected to, we aren't really connected to him the way he would like us to be. Now, oh, you can have a great prayer life. You can read your Bible, you know, 24-7, 365. You can have all this stuff going for you. But if you don't have community, you can have some real problems. Here's, a, here's an interesting story. There was a, a guy, uh, he's the guy who was responsible for the Welsh revival. Come on, Tim, remember his name? I can't remember it right now. This young man, though, was just on fire for God. And he started preaching in Wales and after he preached a while, well, the Welsh revival broke out. They literally had almost the whole nation of Wales was brought to Christ through this guy's preaching. But he got to the point where he wasn't sleeping. And he got to the point where he wasn't connected because he, he thought he had some special call that made him need to be aloof from the rest of the people. And somebody got him off to the side and started telling him stories about himself. And he got sick and he got mentally ill. And Evan Roberts was his name. I finally remembered it. And he was a great man of God that started the Welsh Revival, that was key in the Welsh Revival. But by the end of his life, he had gotten completely separated from the body of Christ, the community. That's not what God wants for us. There were two young men, I think I've told this story to you before, there were two young men out in Reading that were working in the, the offices there with Chris Volaton specifically in his area of responsibility at the time. And these two young men both came to Chris. And they had developed enough community in that, in that group of people that were working with you know, the School of Supernatural Ministry and other things. They, were, they, were, they had developed enough community that these two young men felt safe to come to Chris and they said, hey, uh, we're struggling. Each one of them separately, by the way, didn't know about the other one. We're struggling with looking at stuff on the internet that we shouldn't be looking at. And Chris is like, okay. So what do you wanna, what do you wanna do? And both of them had the idea that they would tell just the people in, in their immediate office, the, just the closest ones to them, and they would ask them to just pray over them every day. And after six months, one of the young men was completely free. It was just like he got completely free. And the other young man was like, I don't know, Chris, I'm still, I'm still struggling. And Chris is like, what do you want to do? And he goes, I just want to tell everybody in the office. Now, you might think, oh, so they went from telling two or three people to telling, you know, 15 or 16. The office was about 150 people, I think, at the time. And so they went, and he had a conversation with the whole office. And they were all like, yeah, man, we're going to pray for you. You're going to get this thing broke off of you. You're going to get free. And he did. Six months later, both of them were free. And have any more problem with it. Why? Because they confessed their sins to one another and prayed for one another that they may be healed. That takes some real relationship, doesn't it? Like, it takes some real trust. That takes a, a community where people feel really safe. That takes things that sometimes it's not easy to get. I used to, by the way, make excuses for them. Well, they're crazy. They're out there on the West Coast. You know, those people, they'll... They'll do anything. and you know, We couldn't do that in the Midwest. Well, they did it in Jerusalem. There's power in dealing with the stuff that you can't deal with by yourself sometimes. There also has to be an established culture, though, where you feel safe. And I, I get that. That's the culture... That community brings us, and that's what Jesus was praying for in the garden. That's what he was after. So, um, Jeremiah, you, you got a boat with an inboard motor, don't you? 
Outboard motor? Oh, so it's an outboard motor. Yeah. So does that motor have to suck in water while it's going down through the thing, or is it okay? If, can you just... Yeah, what's that? It needs to? Because if it doesn't suck in water, then it doesn't have a cooling mechanism. I don't know whether you all know this or not, but there, uh, I think most boats are like this. If you've got a powered boat, you, you put that powered boat in the water before you start the engine. If you start the engine and it's not in water and you let it run very long, what happens to the engine, Jeremiah? It, it burns up. You waste a lot of money. Yeah. The, 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 the engine's designed to work in connection with the water. Christianity is designed to work in the context of community. And let me say this to you people in Facebook land. If you're not in community, you are going to burn up. And you might not even be a Christian. It's not designed to work outside of community. And it's not designed to work just because you come in and you have a good time someplace and you have a good Christian show. There's this thing that's supposed to happen. It's supposed to flow in you to keep you from burning up. I've known people who've gotten separated from fellowship and they got away from God. By the way, though, there is something that also isn't very good that I see sometimes. Are you ready for this? Hey, come on, smack us with it, Pastor Tim. Just smack, smack, smack. I don't want to hurt anybody. I want to save some lives. But there is something that can be worse. It's being burned out or burnt out, however you want to say that. And not able to tell anybody or maybe even recognize it yourself. You know, people who show up at the church lake every Sunday, put their boat in the water, tie it to a pier, stand on it, wave at others. <laughs> Are you getting a picture? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, if, if, if you feel like I'm talking about you, I'm not. I don't think I'm talking about anybody in this church. Help us, Jesus, if I am. There are, there are, there are Christian boats that, that don't run. And it looks good, but they never have the joy of running wide open across the lake. There are people who go to church, they shake hands with a few people, they maybe even give faithfully, but they never enter into community. For years, we actually kind of celebrated those kind of members. You know, the ones that never give you any problem. Because they just drop their boat in the water and tie it to the pier and they never go anywhere. And they're low maintenance. They aren't going to burn up any fuel. They aren't going to burn up any spark plugs. They aren't going to need any repairs. Just a little air in the tires so they can drop it in the lake every week. Boy, I'm in dangerous territory today. Yes, amen. Got a good winch and a rope. You can just tie up. They don't even need an anchor, by the way. Because they're already tied to the dock. So the good news is you know they're never going to be broken down and need you to come to the other side of the lake and get them. <laughs> and even if they leak a little bit, they can just bail a little, you know, and praise Jesus, just throw a little water out. See, when we do real community, we won't have to plan our times of confession or even having a confession event. People in the community will just get to know, people in community just get to know who they're in community with. And then things start to happen. Things get talked about. We work stuff out in our lives. I'm not saying we shouldn't do events, by the way, but events shouldn't be our focus.
Events are the opportunity for people to come and hang out with us so they can see what we're like. But if they come to the event and they don't see what we're like, then there's really nothing to attract them. And that's what attracted them to the original church. Are y'all seeing this picture? So I don't have to wow anybody with a cool event. You know what I want to wow people with? I want to be wowed by you, which is what I saw last summer when visitors came and saw how much we cared for one another. That was glorious. It has to be real, though, family. It has to be real, which means we have to become even more a part of each other's lives. The more we know one another, the more we can flow with one another. The more we know one another, the more we can flow with one another. And I believe that is when the miracles really begin to happen. I believe that is the seedbed for God doing signs and wonders, for God changing hearts and lives. And for some of your family members who you're thinking, oh, I wish I could get them to church. Well, what if they kind of just started seeing what this church was like because you had so many people around you that cared about you that they could see it, that they could see the connections developing. John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. How many of you want to be a friend of God? Me too. You're God's friend if you do what he commands. Now, I want you to think about this with me. Do you know I couldn't find any place where the word command was connected to heal the sick? He said do it, but it wasn't command level. He taught them to heal the sick. He enabled them to heal the sick. He enabled them to raise the dead. He said you're going to do these things. But this command thing kind of got my attention. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. He called us to represent him in the earth. So I think that that's part of what we do. Is we, we touch people's lives and see God do things that they need done in their lives. And we agree with them for God to do things in their lives. But his command, oddly enough, the way he said this, this commandment I give to you. He didn't say, now do all the other commandments. He actually said, I give you a new commandment. And then, by the way, if you follow Jesus' teaching, you'll realize that if you love, you'll fulfill all the commandments, right? So you got one commandment to love one another, to just do one thing. The relationships between us are so important to God, in fact, that he said it was best if we had a broken relationship with someone else to fix it before we come and worship him. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go first and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. This, this relationship thing is just a big deal to God. That's what I'm just trying to pound into my head. And if you didn't need this today, that's fine. I did. We, we need to come to a place where, where we have this going in us so much that people get around us and they're like, what do you guys got going? How do I get me some of that? He wants our relationships with others to work. And he wants it so much that he's willing to set aside our time with him to get that done first. That's kind of amazing when you think about it. By the way, have you ever had a couple of... Some of you got more than one kid. Your kids are fighting. <laughs> 
They can come over and sit in your lap and try to fake it, right? Like they've been fighting with their brother or sister, and then they come over, and they want to hug you and cuddle you and, and tell you, and, and they're like, yeah, they're trying to avoid you making them straighten it out with their brother or sister. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. <laughs> and you're not going to put up with that, right? Like, you go fix that right there. You come over and try to kiss on me and tell me you love me, but you're treating them like, no, you better go fix that right now. That's what a good parent wants to do, right? <laughs> oh, I, I get it. I, I had a couple of kids. I got grandkids. It's fun to watch my kids have to deal with their kids. And I can stand by and say absolutely nothing. Thank you, Jesus. That's so good. And thank you for paying them back, those little heathens, the way they treated me with their little heathens. That's just so good. <laughs> you got three generations in a row here. There's like <laughs> elbows are flying. Let's not forget, we can't love God who we haven't seen if we don't love men who we have seen. 1 John 4.20, look it up. So when our love is out of whack, the only kind of love we can give to God is love that's out of whack. And God wants us to get our love together and we get to practice on each other and the more we learn to love one another, the more the love of God will be experienced by us and the more we will be able to love God in a good way. And this all happens... In the context of Facebook posts, no. So if you're out there on Facebook, you know, uh, we're glad that you watch if you're watching this video, but we would love for you to be connected to us, or if you're already connected someplace else, awesome, good. Get connected. Get in community. Become a part before you come apart. He deserves our best. I'm talking about God. He deserves our best. And our best gets better as we grow in community. And as we grow in community, I believe we'll see our community grow. 